for once, I'm not worried about anybody being in the wrong room. When I normally do conference presentations, you're thinking someone could be in the wrong room. I've been in the wrong room myself when I've been in the audience. But given how difficult it is to find this room, uh, yeah, thank you for your dedication in seeking out this room and the back ways of the Methodist Central Hall. Um, yes, you're not in the wrong room. However, that does mean you should probably wait a few extra minutes for those people who are still walking around in their GPS and can't get fix on this room. Do you all enjoy the keynote or keynotes? Yeah. 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 Sand was a good warm up act for me. Uh, I, I was just thinking in between acts, but I think that you know, there might only be one rule in Agile, and that is there are no rules. Uh, the moment you start adding rules, people start, well, either people start trying to break them, or they start trying to abide by them far too rigorously. And, and both of those things are kind of problems. Uh, yeah. My old mum came through the night when she said moderation and everything. Um, now there's a camera point for me, yeah? Okay, then I find it's video to me, I'll be ready to come to the presentation that you know. I knew I've been involved in some time, but actually, I'll Cambridge last year. I know they called me last year. There's only a day someone tweeted about me and they're oh, that, that's online, is it? Um, are you with camera? Nope. No, no. So the camera might be on fully automatically, but I'm not waiting for me. Um, so how many of you regulars at this conference? Been the dead week before? Yeah. What do you think? Better or not to go to the bar with them? Not as good as the bar with them. But they have sorted out, they haven't checked all the locations in London to find another one that's as confusing as a bottle again. <laughs> Which is difficult, but... Um, last year I did a thing at the barbecue and I was way down to the bottom and I couldn't tell, it's a big room, I couldn't tell to the lights in my eyes whether I had 100 people in the room who were really happy or two people in the room who were really sad. I couldn't really get the feel, but hopefully in this smaller, more intimate setting, uh, I'm going to feel for you. I guess I'm, I'm kind of moving into starting. I'm going to assume the camera's on. The camera guy's just left it ready. Oh, Mr. Camera Guy, maybe you're controlling it remotely. You can put your own phone. Uh, I've just been told by the organizers, apparently, that there is a, an app for you to download onto your Android and Apples, and so far, those of you with a Playbook uh, or Surface. Um, but there's an app you can download, the details on the back of your pack, and at the end of it, there's a survey you can take about this presentation, which is um, quite better than that mechanism of dropping red, green, and amber things into a hat at the end, because I do presentations at conferences where they do that. And about a month after the conference, you get this email from the, the conference organizer saying, you've got 40 greens, and 30 reds, and 20 ambers. And you're like, what does that tell me? Is, is that good? Is that bad? Uh, what, which bit should I improve? Uh, you know, maybe I should just tell people to put the greens in more often. But I would try and buy two. Uh, oh, someone's looking at the camera. Are we yeah. respecting a cameraman? You are a cameraman? Okay. It's, it's unmanned. It's yeah. unmanned, it's automatic. Yeah. Whee! Okay. Yeah. Um, so the camera's on me, they're going to edit it afterwards. We'll, 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 we'll just. just Push on. Uh, you'll see, I think you can all see the screen okay there. Um, this is about Zanpan, which we pronounce Zanpan. Uh, like xylophone, the X gets pronounced more than Z. Uh, and if you haven't spotted it yet, there's the letters X, P, and the word Kanban hiding in there. Pen the P upside down, take away a little bit, straighten out the X, and you've got the word Kanban. Because um, Kanban is the sexy thing at the moment, isn't it? It's new kid on the block. It's only a five-year-old, but it's the one everyone's talking about. Extreme programming is, is the method that dare not speak its name. But this is Dev Week, isn't it? You're all developers, whether that means you're coders or testers or something else. You're probably all really happy with extreme programming, apart from that pair programming bit, which you wish people would just forget all about. Um, but you know, extreme programming, two words guaranteed to scare any manager. 
It contains the word extreme. Since when is your mind been extreme about anything? And programming, which shouldn't that be done in a far away place where people don't answer back and are very cheap? Uh, you know, extreme programming, guaranteed to scale many manager. Um, you know, unlike Scrum, of course, Scrum's nice and cuddly and fairy, you can get certified in Scrum. And Scrum traces its roots back to the Harvard Business Review, don't you know? What they don't tell you about Scrum is, you know, remember that old Monty Python sketch about the confectionery shop? The nice confectionaries and the bolts that jump out and run through your, your mouth and you, the police arrest the guy? Scrum contains the really anti-manager bias and hates us when you hate managers. To get managers to buy this cookie scrum, and then the bolts shoot out and they yeah, execute them. Anyway, Kanban has nothing to do with that. Kanban is very, very, very happy with managers. This is my take on how you put Kanban and extreme programming together. Um, and basically the question is, what do you get if you cross Kanban and extreme programming? Um, a few years ago, I just kind of realized that the way I describe Agile, and I think anybody like me who who pontificates about Agile, calls themselves an Agile coach or consultant or trainer or God knows what else. We all have our own take on Agile. I think you need to have your own take on Agile. And I started to realize my take on Agile was very much rooted in extreme programming, but drew heavily on lean software development, which is the same thing Kanban draws on. And I derived a very similar place to the Kanban folks, but the way I described it was much more infused with extreme programming. So I started to, just to myself more than anything at first, use this word Zanpan to describe the way I think about software development, specifically how I think about what we call agile software development. And over time I started using the word to other people, and other people sounded supportive, and other people said, yes, that's a good idea. And I thought, well, I should start putting my, my thoughts together on this. I started writing some stuff which I thought would be a, a short article, it extended into a book, unfortunately, um, but this is my take on it all. Um, somebody a while ago heard this presentation and said, well really what you're describing is team-centric software development. And if, if this is completely different or massively different for XP or Scrum or Kanban, it's because I, I see the team as the essential unit of work and I think it's about the team. You might get, some of you might be able to sit in your bedrooms and hammer out apps of these things and earn a million dollars. Um, certainly when I was a kid, you know, Matthew Smith and other people sat in their bedroom and hammered out Spectrum games and made a million dollars. Most of the software we produce isn't a, t isn't a solo sport, it's a team sport. Unfortunately, a lot of corporations are wedded to one-man projects. I don't think they're particularly effective. We need to view software development as a team sport. And my version of Agile is significantly different from others because I emphasize the team a lot more. If you've not come across me before, briefly, this is me. A few years ago, I wrote that book, which is a very deep look at Agile and learning and knowledge and software development. More recently, I wrote this book, which doesn't but hardly contains the words Agile and Lean at all. It's a, a book about how software companies organize themselves. I have chapters in some other books. I have street cred. I mean, Kevin is 97 things. I have, a pa I, have a, I have a pattern in a published book. When you, by the way, when you get home, take your gang of four buttons and just tear out the singleton pattern for me, will you? I, I always want to be like, you know, just tear it out. I can get to her side. Tear that pattern out. But there are other patterns books. I also have a chapter in a business analysis book. Uh, and as if this is, this is the book of Van Pan. Um, you can get from the Lean Pub. You know, if you've not come across Lean Pub, you can write books and sell them before you're finished. It, it's fascinating doing a Lean Pub book compared to traditional books. And the great thing is, I've got the best feedback of all $400. <laughs> there's, there's something about money as a feedback mechanism which makes it more, more satisfying than any other type of feedback mechanism. Um, I'll, I'll give you a code at the end so you can download it cheaply if you want. Um, so, apologies. We are talking about Agile. Uh, it's a dev week conference. We're much more <coughs> development centric here than an uh, Agile conference like BCAT. But given Sanders' keynote this morning, you're all, you're all primed and ready to talk about Agile. But the first thing I want to say about Agile is kind of look beyond the label. Some things are Agile. F-16s, fighter jets, are designed to be Agile. They don't fly particularly well. 
unless the pilot and the computers are constantly adjusting them, they tend to drop out of the air. On the whole, unless they're Malaysian, 777s tend to stay in the air. They are designed to be stable. That's the characteristic you want. This is agile. This is a waterfall. I actually happen to think this is a pretty good example of continuous flow. Have you ever tried stopping a waterfall? How do you stop that waterfall? It just keeps on going. I've seen one or two waterfalls in my life that gently come down like that. However, the vast majority of waterfalls I've seen in my life comes down like that. Um, when people use the word agile, or the word waterfall, or any of these other labels, ask them what they mean. What is behind the label? Specifically, this. I bet if I turn to ask each of you in the room individually, do you do Agile? Most of you are developers. And I bet you would tend to answer, well, say, well, we do test and development, we do refactoring, we don't really do iterations or time boxing, we do do the occasional retrospective. And you will answer the question, are you Agile? By reference to Agile as a toolkit, you will tell me what tools you are using and which tools you aren't using. That's one definition of Agile. If I go to your senior managers, they don't know what any of these things are properly. Um, but what they're concerned about is the state of Agile, your business, your organization, your team are quick on your feet, whatever that means. You can respond to change rapidly. If you see an opportunity, you can seize it. The competitor is something you can copy. And something around delivering quickly. They don't really care whether you do stand-ups or test to development. This is what they want. You, you are the people who know the things you can do to deliver the state. I think at the moment, this Agile toolkit are the best tools we have to deliver that state. But if you talk to senior managers, they're concerned about the state of Agile. In the middle, on middle managers, I mean, if you, if you talk to a typical project manager or development manager and say, are you Agile? They will usually answer the question by reference to which Agile method they are doing. Well, we are trying to do Scrum, but we don't do it particularly well. Or we're trying to do extreme programming, but we can't get the test and development to stick. Or we're doing DSDM, but we haven't got any business up. They will, to them, Agile is a method. So when someone says, are you Agile? We say, what is Agile? All three answers are correct. And there's some more I can put up here. But what do you actually mean when I say, you are Agile? What do you, any, of you, any of you claim to be Agile? So I'm going to say yes. On what basis? Top and bottom. Y your company is Agile? Uh, the bit I work for, yes. Okay. And which tools are you using? Some of those ones. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else not Agile would want to be Agile? Ooh, what are you all doing here then? Nobody not Agile, but so you're all Agile, or you're all quite happy doing what you are? Okay, I won't press keep anymore. I don't think the world needs another methodology. We've got plenty of methodologies as it is. And you may have heard some of these, some of these may be new for you, some of them are in the past. Uh, yeah, and if you want, you can just say Zampan's just another methodology. However, I, I, I think uh, I, I just found two grounds. One of which is um, it's your cola. There's Jeff and Ken, they are pushing the world's best selling cola. This is the real thing. Yeah? You're all drinking scum cola. It's a real thing. Um, and then there's, there's Ken Beck. Yeah, you don't hear so much of him these days, but he has a cola especially for programmers. It's got extra caffeine in it. You know, this, is, this is the hard stuff for developers. Um, and then, of course, I think the new kid on the block, a very young looking Dave Hansen, he's the challenger. Yeah, can you take the Kanban challenge? Can you, which cola do you prefer here? Uh, 8 out of 10 teams prefer Pepsi. Yeah. Well, 8 out of 10 statistics are made up on the spot. Um, yeah. Would you like to try Kanban? Don't. Were you, were you dare? It's a bit different, isn't it? And me, um, well, I'm just um, own grand cola. I'm the, stuff, I'm the stuff you buy in Sainsbury's, you know, uh, 
And, you know, it may taste better than some of these, but it's, it's a matter of taste. Uh, but it's certainly cheaper, right? Um, there are no expensive training courses in, in Zagreb. Um, and cheaper and more cheerful now. I want you to think about what is your cola? What's the cola you're drinking? Because the way you're doing things now has good and it has bad. Some of the things you're doing now, you don't need to change, they're perfectly all right. And just because someone comes and says, thou should do user stories, there's no reason to stop doing use cases if use cases are working for you. Why change it if it works? I want you to think about your cola. That's what I'm getting at here. Zampan is my call. It's the way I see the world. It's the way it makes sense to me. I want you to reflect on what makes sense to you and what works for you. I'm going to take you through my approach, and I want you to think how that contrasts with yourselves. So, if you like, Zampan is a cross between Kanban and extreme programming. It's an example of a hybrid method. There's actually lots of hybrid methods out there. Um, most of them don't have names. Most of them just what you do. Uh, it's an example of a roll your own, make your own process. If nothing else, I hope it's an inspiration for you to think about the process that you should be following. Finally, it's team centric software development if you prefer. And perhaps it's just the way Alan Kelly says you should do development. Where did it come from? My experience doing thinking lean and applying extreme programming, which I first documented, I thought blue, white, red, I wrote down how, how we did it, I can't say Kanban, extreme programming, seeing lots of other people. In the beginning, this is what I thought. Zampan is extreme programming, Kanban is lean. And then I thought, well, there's a lot of product management in here, there's a lot. I actually got more emphasis than perhaps Scrum and extreme programming and Kanban on what are you building, who is, who is feeding the team. I, I always get upset about scrum masters like like Sander does. I, I think you get upset. Scrum masters get all the attention. He had a slide of saying 300 trained scrum masters. Scrum masters get all the attention. The really important role is the product owner role. The really important role is not the scrum master. It's the person who's deciding what you're doing next. Whether you call them product owner, business analyst, product manager, requirements engineer, systems engineer, or something else. It's what are you doing next. That's the key role, and unfortunately, the spotlight is always shining on Scrum Master. And there's this other role in the shadows, which is far more important. So one of the things I'd like to do here is emphasize the product management and what are you building aspect. Ultimately, it's all these things and a bunch of other stuff. Stuff I've just picked up along the way, experience and reading. The principles, iterations. This is what I did for a lot from Kanban, but I like iterations, and I like iterations for one very specific reason, deadlines. Human beings are very good at working to deadlines. How many of you did a college course where you had to hand in coursework at the end of the term, the end of the semester, after six weeks, you had to hand in a piece of work? How many of you did that? Yeah, the vast majority of you. When did you do the work? Well, the day before. <laughs> Anyone can push, push the envelope further? Night before. Night before. Awesome. Right, the night before. Two days, Two days after. <laughs> Did you negotiate the extension? <laughs> yeah. Um, is there a project manager in the room? So if there's a project manager here, they would have done it much earlier, wouldn't they? They'd have planned the work and they'd have worked the plan. Yeah? They can count the project manager to do that. You know what, there's, there's rationale to doing stuff like it maximizes the learning you're doing on the course, it minimizes the chances that the, the lecture is going to change, we push the deadline back, or change part of the work, or perhaps cancel it altogether. You know, leaving work to last minute actually is a rational strategy. And as human beings, we're very good at that. You know, how many of you missed an aeroplane lately? How many of you ever missed an aeroplane? One to a few people, and he gets on and off airplanes all the time. Uh, you know, we're very good at meeting deadlines. Let's, let's harness that in iterations. Um, invest in quality, quality is free. Philip Crosby, quality is free, 1980 quality. Uh, I think, for me, this is really lacking in Scrum. 
You know, most of the scrum people you meet will say, if you're doing scrum, do the technical practices from extreme programming. Yeah? There's a few scrum folks who don't agree with that. If you're doing the scrum processes, which are now in an interval to extreme programming, and the XP technical practices, are you doing XP or are you doing scrum? I'll let you answer that question. Um, <coughs> it's similar for Kanban. Kanban doesn't have any technical practices. Kanban doesn't emphasize quality. But again, if you talk to most Kanban people, they will quickly come up with, say, you know, quality is really important. Kanban doesn't really work if you've got crummy quality. But I don't see quality as a, a first line item in Kanban and Scrum. It's there in XP, although, it, 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 you know, XP is kind of yesterday's method. So, invest in quality. Visualize, see to learn. If you can't see something, you can't learn. You know, a football team goes on the field and everyone knows the score. You know, and a lot of sports will have a, a digital scoreboard of telling you the score. How many software teams you don't know what the score is? You don't know how, many, how much has been delivered, how much is yet to do, when the deadline is, when it's moving. You know, you, often it's management by rumor. This economies of scale. There's Kanban folks talk about small batch size. I think that's a bit academic. You have all internalized the idea that bigger is cheaper. If you go down to your local Tesco's and you pick up a four pint carton of milk and you get to the checkout and you realize the guy next to you has got four one pint cartons of milk and he's paying less than you are, you will probably complain. You have come to believe that buying four pints of milk in one carton should be cheaper than buying four one pint cartons of milk. Yeah? And we see this all over our society. You know, all the buy one, get one free kind of offers. That may be true in milk, and it may be true in some industries. In software development, it does not apply. In software development, when you get bigger, you get more expensive. Large teams tend to be less, less productive than small teams called communication over it. Large pieces of software to test tend to be more expensive to test than lots of small pieces of software. A 300 bug, bug list is much more difficult to manage and administer than a bug list of three, which happens to occur again and again and again. Think small. When you are at work, rid yourself of anything which may be considered economies of scale. There are a couple of exceptions where economies of scale apply, but generally, get economies of scale out of your head. Unless you have good evidence to show me, you should assume you have diseconomies of scale, and going smaller will be cheaper. Emphasize flow. It's a work flowing through the team. It's not whether any one individual is particularly busy, it's whether the work flows through the team. Scrum, you load up your planning meeting, you load up your sprint backlog, you burn it down. You load it up, you burn it down. We don't want to be doing that. We want steady state flow. That also allows you to think about how you can get rid of the peaks and troughs. However, as I'll tell you in a minute, I'm not, I'm not um, hard on this idea of work not spanning sprints. I'm happy for work to span iterations. Team centric. It's the team that does the work. The team is a sausage machine. And that means they can do planned work and they can do unplanned work. There is no law that says that planned work is inherently more valuable than unplanned work. If you go back to the office on Friday or Monday mm -hmm. and you find that your main competitor has let their domain collapse, you could buy it. But that's not in your plan. But is it valuable? For a lot of people, that would be really, really valuable. Just because something is unplanned doesn't mean it's less valuable. I'm happy for teams to do unplanned work, but we need to manage it, we need to see it, visualize it. Ultimately, this is all going to, to uh, a topic called known projects or beyond projects, which is another presentation I think. The two ideas will merge at some point in the near future. Um, projects are an accounting code. Successful software lives. Software which is used lives. Software which is used has change requests. People want to do different things. Because people use the software, they want it to work differently. And because people are using it, when Apple or Microsoft have ever released a new operating system or a new browser, it needs to be updated. 
Software which isn't used is dead software and doesn't require any changes. Projects have end dates. Your software, if your software ever gets to the end date, it's bad news. Nobody's using it. You need a new job. We need to get away from this idea of projects starting and stopping. It's destructive. Goodhart's law, and I'll come back to it in a little bit. Constructivist learning. So, Sander kept referring to Shu Harvey this morning. Um, I don't think he ever states whether he was for it or against it. I think Shu Harvey is an awful model. I hate it. The Shu Harvey model is, is this, of course, for the Dreyfus model that, that you are. You are the apprentice, and you will learn from the master, and the master will show you how to do all this, and you will learn, and you will learn, you will learn from the master, and then one day the master will say, you can do this yourself, and you can go out into the world, and you can be the master. What that's actually doing is actually building a learned dependency, because this gentleman here, Steve here, is, is, is the apprentice to David here. He learns that David has all the answers, David's the man to go to. He's not building any of his own capability. The day when, when David has made like Yoda and disappeared and sent his way out, Steve here is saying, well, what do I do with that? What did what Dave do? Uh, well, what, well, how, can I think of a problem we solve together? Yeah. Constructivist learning underlying all this, bit yeah, academic maybe. You've got to learn to make your own sense of the world. You've got to make your own solutions. You've got to make your own understanding. You can look at other people. You can learn from other people. But ultimately, you are the center of the learning activity, not some master. You're not copying, copying, copying. That looks great for consultants. You, you, ha you hire big name consultancy in, and they bring all their staff in, and your people learn from the consultants. And then one day, the consultant's project is finished, and the consultants are no longer there. And your people are like, well, what do we do? What do we do before the consultants? So let's do that. In practice, technical practices, number one on the list. Test and run, test based development, and I'll include BDD in this. Automate your freaking tests. If you can't automate them, at least write some. The days when we used to step through our code in a debugger to find the bugs that should be gone. Continuous integration, all the other good stuff to get your quality up. I used to say to people, you say, where do I begin with Agile? I used to say technical practices. Most of the people I used to know are developers. And as a developer, you can just stop doing this stuff. You're the professional. If you think one of these would benefit you, you can just do it. You don't need a management value. You can just do it. You can just pick up one of the books on TPD. You can read it. You can start applying it to your own code. That's what being a professional is about. No, does your manager come around here and sort of say, you should be using some go-tos? You've got no go-tos in your code? Well, you know, that, 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 this is you, your professional, you do it. Teams can work on more than one stream of work. Yeah, I love the idea that we can re the team, and the team are going to be dedicated to this sprint, this project, this product, whatever. Do you know how many teams I've seen who are like that? You know, you do see them occasionally, but usually the projects are massive. You know, most teams, if you've got any continuity in the organization, you're going to have the zombies from the past coming back. A project you worked on six months ago has come back and you've got to fix a bug in it. Something which is supposed to be finished a year ago, suddenly somebody's got to go and work on that. And many, many teams are actually trying to support two projects or two products at one go. As an individual, I don't want you multitasking during the day, but I'm happy for the work speed to be working on multiple. I'm really keen on breaking stories down. I think by breaking work down, you get to smaller pieces of work which flow through the system better. And I will still keep estimation. I feel controversial at the moment. But I think estimation is a great tool for teams, for the team to know how much work they can take in the near future. I don't have much truck with estimations for the longer term, you know, beyond the next quarter. The estimation for the next two weeks, great. Between now and the next quarter, a bit of it. Beyond the next quarter, estimation is for the birds, it's random numbers, get yourself some dice. Well, let me take that back. Estimation of effort is a, is a random exercise. Estimation of value is far more interesting. I'm fed up of seeing organizations where they say, we've got all this stuff we want to do. We want the development team to estimate how long it'll take. And then we, the business, will organize it into some order which we think will be the optimal order of doing it. 
That's just awesome about face, isn't it? You, the business, you estimate how valuable this stuff is. And when you understand where the value is, then we can talk to the team about what we can produce soon. But until such time as you, are, you can do that, what you're basically talking about is cost plus pricing. How much does it cost? What can we sell it for? And as every salesman knows, that leaves money on the table. Let's talk about value. Where is the value? Stop scheduling work based on effort. Start scheduling work based on value. Benchmark against yourself. Velocity over commitment. Although, yeah, I used to rail against Scrum here, but here Scrum has quietly dropped the idea of commitment. The idea that he was committed. So, look at your own past performance. This is not financial services. Well, some of you probably are financial services. But in software development, past performance is a pretty good indicator of future performance. I've been experimenting with um, PowerPoint spades and stuff, so it's perhaps not as slick as I normally do. So, product ownership I mentioned before. This idea that somebody, whether they're business owners, product manager, programmers, engineers, system engineer, or something, is thinking about what you're building next and making sure the thing you're building next is the highest value. And they're also throttling the work to make sure it comes in at the right pace for you. And they're ensuring that the low value items don't get in. This is really important. This is where you might apply whip limits. And this is where you want absolute prioritization. Don't give me no freaking Moscow rules. How many of you working with Moscow rules? You have people in your office saying Moscow rules, must have, should have, yeah, yeah. You know what's happening right here. You know what Moscow rules means? Fuck you. That's Moscow rules, okay? Yeah? Seriously, Moscow must, must, should, could, would, yeah. And, and what always happens? You've got, you've got 100 requirements. How many of them are musts? All of them. All of them, yeah. As, you know, usually people, the answer I get back, you know, 60%, anywhere between 60% and, and 100%. And what the business does when the business says, look here, Mr. Developer, these all must, must. What the business is saying is, I've got a bunch of stuff here. I, as the business guy, cannot determine any prioritization here. But you, the man with the keyboard, the man who understands inner classes, you are the best placed person to prioritize these, yeah? At which point the business abdicates any right to come back in future days and say, what do you mean you did that one first? Didn't you know that was the one I really wanted? Moscow rules might be okay if you're faced with 100 page requirements, but really, when you're feeding a team day to day, one, two, three, four, five, there's an infinite number of integers, you aren't going to run out. Prioritization is based on absolutes. Planning. Okay, planning is not just about dance charts or Microsoft projects. Planning includes architecture. Planning is not evil, it's just don't expect to follow your plans to the letter. Planning is a learning exercise. Whether you're talking about schedule planning, or architecture planning, or team planning, or whatever, it's about rehearsing tomorrow, going through some more if exercises. And I think there are three planning arises we'll try and talk about in a minute. Pick and mix. I'm picking all the bits I see out there in the Agile Toolkit, and mixing them together. I've worked out what my principles are, so when I mix them together, I can see whether they're consistent and what the result is going to be and which bits don't fit and you know, that kind of stuff. Think about the bits that work for you. Think about what you've taken, the bits you haven't taken, and why you've not taken them, and try and work out your own principles. And then so work down to your principles, then work back up. And action over words. The idea how fed up I am of meeting people say, we're planning to adopt agile. We're thinking about this. We, we're going to we're, we're going to rent some requirements documents while we work out what we can do with Agile, and we are, you know, JFDI. You've got to do this stuff to understand it. Stop talking. Start doing. Fit the work to the time. I've already said deadlines are good. The deadline is coming around. The tube's here. I'm getting a tube home tonight. You know, if the tube pulls in and it's packed, I'm not going to smell somebody's armpit. I'm going to wait for the next tube. You fit the work to the time. And evolutionary change is good. You can have lots of small bangs. You don't want need one big bang in here. Lots of small little bangs. Big bangs are really risky. 
We'll, you know, we like the idea of big bang, soon the world will be better. But it's a very difficult thing when that really happens. And usually when big bangs go off, there, there's some fallout, there's some problems with them. One of the problems we face is as you go up an organisation, it gets more and more difficult to get managers time. You know, how, how, if you want, if you want an hour of time with your, your manager, you've probably got to have him, you know, what, 10,000 pounds to on the table? Does he get out of bed for 1,000 pounds of time? Probably not. You go to his manager, he's probably 100,000 pounds of time on the table. You get to the CEO at the top of a large organisation, you know, a Barclays or something. Well, what's a Barclays? What's he going to get paid? 25 million a year? Like half a million a week. That means half a million a week. Well, well, let's assume he does 50 hours a week, he committed. So that, you're talking about 10,000 an hour. You, you aren't going to get any time with the CEO of Barclays unless the thing you're talking about is worth more than 10,000 pounds an hour. Um, but with small banks, is small banks make small improvements. Small banks are small costs. Small banks are small profit margins. And so the people at the top of the organization don't have time to talk about them. So you want to promise a big bang with big money. That gets you into the C-suite. But that's wrong. In our world, we're lots of small banks. Let's have some detail for all of that. Team sentient. Your team is a sausage machine. You put in pork meat, you get pork sausages. You put in chicken meat, you get chicken sausages. You put in horse meat, you get beef sausages. Yeah. Okay. Work goes in, software comes out. Yes? Ultimately, you only actually need this guy here. He's obviously the coder. Because if you don't have this guy to test at the end, well, he can still produce the sausages. Or we can probably still sell them. You know, they might be a bit variable. Some people might complain, but we can test when the end users get them, they can test them for dinner. Uh, so we, we, we can have this guy. And this, this analyst person who's breaking all the, all the requirements messed down in nice bite sized requirements and specifications, we can probably get rid of her as well. Because this, this guy could pause and just pull out a bit of sausage meat and shape it and throw it in. Uh, that's the thing about software development. The only role you actually need is this guy, the developer. I'm sorry if you're a project manager or a tester. I'm really respecting you. You do really good work. But at the end of the day, you come to redundancies. The testers are the first guy to get let go. And the requirements folk aren't, aren't far behind. If you let go of the guy who turns the handle on the sausage machine, you haven't got a software development organization. You can say you can outsource this rule, and true, you can outsource this to, to many, many places. But ultimately, what you're basically doing is you're having the sausage handle turned by, by somebody with a long stick. The moment you stop having somebody code, you aren't doing software development. And if you ever come up with one of those tools which allows the requirements person to paint pictures and write code like that, well, they just became a developer. Requirements go in, specific software comes out. Many projects, so you have different types of, this is a magic sausage machine, it doesn't mix up the sausage meat. In goes the work, out comes the software, in goes the work, out comes the software, in goes the work, out comes the software. It can be from different places. As long as the people in this team have the skills and the knowledge to take work from those places, they can produce software here. This is how we want to optimize the team. So, keep your teams together. This is really important for me. Don't break up successful teams. I call it corporate psychopathy. When, when an organization gets a team, and the team is performing, and one day they say, hey team, project's over. Come along here and collect your P45s. Contractors, go back to where the cesspool you crawled out of. Uh, <laughs> Why do you break up successful teams? You spend all that time getting a team successful and productive, and then get to the end of a project, and you break them up. A friend of mine, Ivan Moore, pointed out to me the other week when we were talking about this. He said, you know, I've never seen a team broken up. So they always stay together, they just get rolled onto something else. I think actually Ivan's right. The project mentality is we assemble a team to do a piece of work, and when the work is done, we let the team go. I mean, we don't usually do that. We do do that sometimes. It, it's psychopathic. But what's more likely to happen is we assemble a team, they do some work, and then there's another project on the same code, and another project, and another project, and another project, and we delude ourselves into thinking there's an end date with these projects. It's not going against projects. If you have a stable team, there are lots of good things flow from it. You can get good estimates. You can get good velocity. When you change the team, 
And the idea of velocity goes out the window. Only when the team is stable can you get a stable velocity. A team that stays together can work out how to improve their performance. A team that stays together can optimize the way they're working, they can do their retrospectives. If you change team members all the time, what's the retrospective about? Uh, I also like bigger teams. We have Sander pointed out, Scrum says between three and nine. I'm happy for a team to go up to 14. I could even, I could even imagine a team more than 14. You know, I talk about an amoeba model, start with a small team, grow it if necessary, split it, grow those teams, split them. If you have a bigger team, it's less susceptible to variability. If you've got a team of two people, and one of them gets yanked down to go and work on something that was supposed to be finished six months ago, you just lost half your productivity. Your predictability is out the window. If you've got a team of 10 people and someone gets yanked out to go and work on something else, you've still got 90% of your productivity. You, you're in with a fighting chance. And it's not just people getting yanked out, it's people being ill, it's people being having holidays, it's pieces of work you're trying to do turning out to be 10 times bigger than another piece of work. Larger teams, this is one of the exceptions to the diseconomies of scale, larger teams can cope with variability but more better. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Larger teams are more stable when the variability increases, when unexpected events happen, a larger team can cope with them a bit better. I'm not saying a team of 100, but I'm, you know, this is matching number seven. It doesn't have any validity. Magic number seven teams, go and read the original magic number seven paper. The important bit is the final paragraph. I forget the guy's name, but he says, says after all this time, research in magic number seven, I have to conclude there's no evidence. It seems right, it seems intuitive, but I can't find any psychological evidence that seven is a magic number. If you have a bigger team and you lose somebody, it's not so bad. If you have a bigger team and you hire somebody, remember, Adding people to a late project slows it down. Adding people to a team at any point slows it down. If you add somebody to a team of two people, and for the first few weeks that new hire needs all the attention of somebody, you've just halved the team's ability capacity. If you've got a team of 10 people and you add a new hire, they can still get permanent attention from people, but they're only taking 10% of anybody. Bigger teams can cope with hiring new people. You get more predictability. You're more likely to have all the skills you need to do the work. And teams include everybody. This is one of my um, arguments. Again, Sander can highlight this morning. Scrum says there's a Scrum Master, product owner, and the team, the developers, whatever. And it's really vague as to who they are. And I've met people where they, include, you know, they interpret that as everyone on the team is a coder. Everybody writes code. I've met other people who say, well, the team that have two testers and a couple of business analysts, and at the bottom here, there's a guy who writes code. Yeah, it, it's too, too ambiguous. What I say is, everybody you need to do the work is on the team. You have the skills you need in the team. <coughs> you as an expert, you have the skills in the team. If you keep having small teams, three, four, five people, there's every chance that you don't have sufficient skills in SQL or UI design or something. It also becomes difficult to go up to small teams to justify specialists. And some things like UXD work, you really do want a specialist, somebody who knows what they're talking about, somebody who's got time to go and do user groups. If all your teams are three or four people, you're going to end up splitting your UXD person across all those teams. I'd rather have one larger team, one dedicated UX person, and allow the team to work on multiple streams of work. Quality. I apologise if anyone is sensitive in nature. I got told off for this tweet the other week, but I couldn't work out how I had offended feminists. Um, <laughs> Philip Crosby, the 1980s quality guru. Quality has much in common with sex. Everyone is for it, under the right conditions, of course. Everyone feels they understand it. E well, enough though, they wouldn't want to explain it. And everyone thinks execution is only a matter of doing the natural thing. Yes? And of course, most people feel that everything would be okay and better if the other people just did their bit better. Developers, wouldn't it be better if the testers actually tested properly? If they didn't try and ask you for all those not a bugs? And, and testers, wouldn't it be better if the coders just wrote it right first time? You know, and, and, and analysts, don't you wish the developers spoke English and understood what you were saying to them, you know? Um, <laughs> It's, it's not enough to just say, you know, we need quality. You've got to work out what's in there. Let's 
be clear on why we want quality. Capers Jones, perhaps the best guy in the world at software metrics, although he himself, in the beginning of his book, says he doesn't have anywhere near the data he'd like to have on software metrics. For a large project, the cost of producing paper documents is more expensive than the code itself. He also says on the largest projects, which are largely military, there's more documentation than you can read in Korea. You could, you know, someone could graduate from one of our esteemed universities this summer. They could go and work for BAE or Lockheed on the F-35. And like I've experienced, you'd be sat at the desk and they'd say, your PC's not arrived yet, guys, so here's some documentation. When you finish reading it, come to us and we'll get you working on something. They will collect their pension before they finish reading the F-35 documentation. Okay? There's nothing wrong with writing documentation as long as somebody somewhere considers it valuable. Documentation is just another deliverable. If you want it, you write a card, you write a story, you write a task, whatever it is you want, and you schedule it and you produce it just the same as anything else. And if nobody can put a value on documentation, then don't freaking do it, because it's expensive. But in the context of quality, this is the important quote. Outranking paper and home, the cost of repairing defects is the single most expensive activity. And you know this. You know your projects spend most of their time fixing bugs. Or at least a lot of you have experienced this. Some of you have got yourselves out of that particular hell. What is also true here is that bug fixing, rework, destroys predictability. Because when you get to the end, if you've not got good quality, you have to ask yourself, do I feel lucky? When this enters testing, are they going to find one bug? Two bugs, ten bugs, a hundred bugs, and how many are you going to fix? If you reach your end date and you've got quality, now I'm not saying you're going to make all bugs, you know, but hopefully you know, you've got a number you can deal with. When you've got rampant bugs, it's not really a question of how many, how many you're going to fix or when you're going to stop fixing them, but how low can you go? How many can you ship with? If you don't have quality, you blow predictability. If you don't have quality, you push up cost. You, know, you push up cost because you push up time. <coughs> That's why Capers Jones says, projects with low defect potentials don't let the bugs get in there in the first place, and high defect removal efficiency, when they do, get them out. Have the shortest schedules, lowest cost, best customer satisfaction levels. What's not to like here? Your engineers, you know this faster, better, cheaper should not exist. It's perhaps a sad indictment of the state of much of the software industry that we can get faster, better, cheaper. So quality, I think of it like this. When I say quality, I specifically mean software defects because I cannot think of a piece of software in the world which is buggy and we consider high quality. Any of you know one? High quality piece of software contains a lot of bugs. I think for any piece of software anywhere in the world be considered high quality. You need very you need to get defects as low as possible. You need a limited number of defects. The second characteristic you want of high quality software is maintainability, changeability. Call it what you will. Because if you don't have that, a you can't fix any defects you're going to have. B your developers will complain. And C most importantly of all, if it's not maintainable, if it's not changeable, it can't live. If you can't change your software, or if the cost of change is exorbitantly high, then it can't change, and the world around it is changing, and the people who are using it want it to change. If you can't change your software, then it's going to be dead pretty soon. And I think these two attributes are true. For any piece of software, if you talk about quality, these two attributes hold. It has to have high maintainability and low defects. There may be other characteristics that, in your context, you want for your quality software, such as ease of use, standards conformance, perform uh, uh, ease of use, standards conformance, performance, how fast does it execute, accuracy, or a whole bunch of other things. They, I do not deny they are quality, but I think they are context specific. And I encourage you to sit down with your teams and say, what is quality to this team? If you decide that defects have nothing to do with you as far as quality is concerned, if you decide that maintainability is not important, I'll be very surprised if people in your call would like to know. I think one of the problems we face 
is so often developers are, are faced with um, somebody else. Let, let them remain nameless who comes on and says, guys, we don't need perfection, we just need good enough. Stop gold plating, stop going for this high quality, we need to friggin' ship. <laughs> if you lower the quality on the defects, Capers Jones, oops, Capers Jones tells us our schedules are going to go up, our customer satisfaction is going to go down, and our price, our costs will go up. If you sacrifice maintainability, I will grant you, you might get a short term win. But if anyone ever uses the software and everyone wants to change, you're going to pay for it. I do not deny getting the balance right here in not gold plating for doing a quality job is difficult. That's why you're called engineers. Engineers. Engineer solutions within constraints, and that's why you get paid for big money. If this wasn't hard, you wouldn't get paid, you wouldn't get paid. Outside of that, you may or may not have these things, but sit down with your team, and the next time someone says, we don't need it perfect, we just need good enough, inquire into what is just good enough for them. Which bit of, which aspect of quality do they want to sacrifice? Because they often were talking at odds like that. And I, I do think most software managers if you say to them, are you saying I should, put, I, should, I should let more bugs go in? If they answer yes, then they are not aware of the facts that Capers Jones and others have presented us, that more bugs lead to slower deliveries. And I think if they do become aware, most of them are pretty bright guys, they get it. And those who don't, shouldn't be in our industry. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way now. I guess I played around with the slide transition, silly me. Iterations, I'm a fan of iterations, I like them. You know, I, 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 Kanban has this cadence thing, which I suspect most people don't know the word, meaning the word cadence. I guess I can look up in the dictionary. I suspect it's often implemented by iterations. Um, it's a two-week iteration. At the end, you should be releasable. Whether you release or not is another question. That's a business decision. But the test of your process is whether every second Wednesday you can do a release. Now, more and more teams are doing that. Whoops, not doing that. Oh, I want this bit down here. Come on, they're doing this. More and more teams are releasing all the way through there. More and more teams are just releasing as you go along. <coughs> I like this, I think this is good. There's nothing sacrosanct about the two week release. For some people, two week releases are great. For some people, they do a lot better by doing more regular releases and getting more value out of it sooner. For some people, Two week releases are far too often. However, if you can't do a two week release, how long do you need? Three weeks? Four weeks? Two months? Iterations make you better because they harness the deadline effect. More importantly, iterations stick a rod up your back and make you get better. If you can't do something useful in two weeks, then what do you need to change to be able to do something useful in two weeks? If your UAT cycle takes two weeks, how do you get it down? Here's a clue. If you wait these cycle takes two weeks, it's probably because it's really another system integration cycle. You've got so many bugs, the UAT people are finding them. If it takes you two weeks to make a release to a live server, the something long real release procedure. Working in short periods is about getting yourself better. If you want to release more often, fine. If you want to release less often, fine. But every two weeks, you give an option to the business. Continue or stop. You give them a real option, not a, well, if you stop us now, you're going to have to give us another two or three months of bug fixing. If you stop us now, you're going to have to write off all the money you've spent on this, because really we need some more time to bug fix it. That's not an option. That's a ransom demand. Whoops. Uh, Need my fancy smart transition. So iteration is the flow. Iterations bring a lot of structure. Two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, you know where you are. But, they instruct the flow, it's particularly strict iterations. This business about work must be finished at the end of the iteration, utterly rubbish. There's a team up in North London I met, and they try and exercise this rule. And what the managers have noticed is, towards the end of the iteration, the, developed, the testers are a lot less inquisitive. The testers are a lot more prone to just pass stuff through, because the testers, like the developers, are committed. And so they need to get this stuff signed off. And then they leave. So, so you, know, you can think about it. The testers are kind of down Starbucks at the beginning of the iteration. At the end of the iteration, the developers are down Starbucks, you know. <laughs> Except for the fact that 
It's a funny thing that the, the testers find bugs after the iteration is closed. They find bugs in work that's recently been done, which means whenever a test, a developer gets towards the end of the iteration, um, there's some bugs for them to fix. They, they can pad out with bugs. It's convenient, that, isn't it? Yeah. Even if all your stories fit within an iteration, suppose all your stories are six days, a two-week iteration, that gives you four days. What do you do for the last four days? Do you go home early? Or, or do you scratch around and find some more work? What do you do? Or do you make the six days become four, um, ten days? Um, you, you get all these stu yeah, There's all sorts of funny things happening in the tale. <sighs> strict iterations. There's one good thing about strict iterations. They force you to think small. What can we do in two weeks? But that's a learned skill. It's going to take you time to do. But when you're starting off with this stuff, you're not going to get stuff to fit within two weeks just because I stood here and said, thou shalt have all your work fit within two weeks. You've got to learn to do that. I'm happy for work to span over more than one sprint, but I'm going to apply the three strikes and you're out rule. I want to break it down. We're only going to count stuff when it's completed, so you're going to get an And if it keeps flowing over, spanning set two, three iterations, I'm, I'm going to, you know, it's a red flag. Flowing over one, from one sprint to another, okay, it happens. If you want to flow over to a third sprint, that's a red flag, what's going on here? If it's flowing over a third time to the fourth sprint, uh, action must be taken. So deadlines are good. You're very bad at estimating time. You're very good at meeting deadlines. Harness it. Okay, this is the stuff I was just saying. Deadlines are also good for synchronizing work. Get away from this. We must have a Gantt chart and some estimates so we know when this team and that team will complete. How many of you fly like that? Airplanes and trains just leave the station on a regular schedule. If you want to get from here to, uh, I, I don't know, you want to get from here to Sochi, you look at the schedules and you get yourself there. And it might mean you have to spend some time at Moscow Airport, do 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 do, while you're waiting for the flight to Sochi. You know, but if you look out and rent a jet of your own, that's quite expensive. And then you've got to work out all the air traffic rules and all that. Deadlines give you synchronization points. It's like trains or airplanes, there are schedules. Your team's running two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. They might be slightly staggered, you might get some time to spend at Starbucks while you wait for the next iteration to leave. We synchronize on deadlines. I love the cadence stuff, I love all the Kanban stuff, but it complicates scheduling. I'm going to be one of these fancy transitions. So unplanned work. I said, I love the idea of, of being friends in your team, but unplanned work happens. And the reality is, some of the unplanned work that happens is of much higher value. Trying to ring fence some teams is actually a good way to annoy a lot of people in the organization, because reality is, stuff happens. So, I'm happy with work arriving late. What I will do is I will give it a yellow card. I will plan the work we want to plan in the meeting. An unplanned work, I will put on a yellow card. I might do retrospective estimation with it. At the end of the iteration, I will look and I will count up how many yellow cards versus how many blue cards or white cards. And if there's estimates on points on them, I'll use them. What I want to know is, for this team, what is the proportion of unplanned versus planned work? And you may find, in some teams, that although you think there's a lot of unplanned work, this team I know in Slough, when I met them, they complained about unplanned work. We gave them yellow cards, we found that there's only one a week or something like that. It's just they tend to be quite high profile. And unplanned work wasn't really disruptive for them. For some teams, you're going to find there's a lot of unplanned work. And the right thing to do is to optimize your process to cater for unplanned work. You might have one person just handle unplanned or something. And for other teams, you're going to say, well, actually, we need to, we need to reduce the unplanned work. Because the unplanned work that's coming in is, is wrong, or it's coming from the wrong source. Or, or people need to think about asking. See what unplanned work you're doing, and then decide what you're doing. What's the retrospective estimation for? Yeah. Um, so if you're using points-based estimation, you try and estimate work before you do it. Turns out humans are really bad at estimating how long work stuff will take to happen in the future. And we're also really bad at estimating how long things will take retrospectively. When you are asked for an estimate, it's more correct to say you're being asked for a prospective estimate. Retrospective estimates, how long this may take, which you are equally as bad at as you are prospective estimation. Generally, I don't bother with any kind of backward-looking estimation. 
If you're using yellow cards, I will sometimes say put a retrospective estimate on the yellow using the same, same point scoring system as prospective estimates. And that can give you an idea of whether the yellow was big or small or what the proportion was. But sometimes you just count the cards. You can just see what, what's there, what you've got. But why do I need to know how many points that story was that has been finished now? You might not. But it might be, if you're trying to work out how, what proportion of the team's time goes on unplanned work, if all your stories are estimated in points, it would be useful to have some kind of comparison with, with what the unplanned work. So you can say, well, we have 20 points of planned work and 5 points of unplanned work. It might help the mathematics. Not always necessary. Um, planning meetings, break work down. Uh, I use blue stories for business facing stuff, user stories, product backlog items, persona stories, whatever technique you like, these are big and they're meaty and they mean something to the business. Because that's the only way the business people will want to talk about them. There's no point in having stories to say, do the database schema. A, nobody ever bought a database schema unless you happen to be a specialist in database schemas and they come to you specifically because the techies have come to you by other now. You know, business doesn't buy database schemas and they don't particularly want to talk about them. Developer tasks, smaller stuff, tester tasks, that's on whites. We break the blues down to the whites. This is largely a design process. In breaking the blues down, you are having a collective discussion about how you will do this. Some teams may not need to do this because the team understand their design and they, they talk regularly enough. Most teams, I find, it benefits them to break the blues down to smaller whites because that causes a design discussion. And for the same reason, I tend to keep estimation. Because I think when you estimate whites, and you, you can start to see whether there's design issues you haven't considered. If a team regularly estimates whites and they're three or four points, and suddenly one is 20, there's a design discussion there you need to have. Perhaps there's some risk involved. Perhaps it's not well defined. Estimates. Some of you may have seen the no estimates hashtag on Twitter. I have a lot of sympathy with those guys. I like estimates for the team. I think estimating work helps the team decide how much work you can take on. Helps the team benchmark its own performance. You can extend that slightly a few iterations into the future, but you can't extend it very far because that changes. Your capacity changes and your estimates change. So it's useful for scheduling, perhaps not essential. At the very least, it provides the developers with a safety valve. If the business come around and demand and demand something, the developers can at the very least say, that's 100, whether you, you know, whatever technique you're using. Beyond, beyond three months, you might have roll dice. It's a random exercise. You don't know how, 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 how long something is going to take. You probably don't know what it is either. If somebody says, oh, can you translate this to French in six months' time? What are they actually asking? <coughs> the user interface, <coughs> the admin console, the error messages. And depending on how much time you've got available, you may decide to do some and other bits. If you've only got two weeks to translate the whole thing to French, you might say, bugger the admin console, bugger the error messages, we'll just translate what the end users see. If you've got a month, you might do everything. If you've got three weeks, you might do the end user interface and the error messages or something. You can change the work in what you're doing to fit the time you've got. Beyond three months, I think there's too many variables to do any kind of, any kind of useful estimation. And as I mentioned before, before you estimate anything, estimate the value. Effort estimates are difficult. What we should really be estimating is the value. That's even more difficult. Yeah. Maybe I'm being a little bit sneaky here. But every business person says, why can't the developers actually estimate this? I said a business person has never actually tried to estimate the value. They've never done it themselves. So A, they have to put them in that position. But B, before we start estimating effort, if you estimate effort, people see pieces of work with numbers on them, effort numbers, and they immediately start to schedule them based on the cost, the effort of doing them. And that is so wrong. So let's get proper estimates on the value of these pieces of work before we even attempt to think about how much work is involved. 
translating for the French market? Is that worth a million euros? 10 million euros? You know, we're engineers. We can engineer a solution within a constraint, but you know, <coughs> translating to the French market, as Louis said, there's at least three different ways of doing it. And which one you choose may well depend on how much value there is. If there's not much value in the French market, you'll go for the low end solution. But you need to understand that constraint. Excuse me. Yeah. But it, that's something that the team wouldn't know, right? I don't know the value. No, I don't. I don't think developers would know the value. And if a developer tries to tell me the value, I'd definitely not come back. This is someone a business hat on. We call product owner, business analyst, systems analyst, requirements, uh, requirements engineer, something else. In a way, they are a member of the team. But they are part of the team producing that product. If you like, they're like the goalkeeper. Everyone else is out there writing code. They've got a very different role, but they're still part of that team. They may have a different reporting line for the business, but they're still part of the team who are trying to live at that product. I don't think it will. There are people who have developers to do requirements and specifications. I think that's great when you can do it, and it's great if you recruit for it. I also think that I'm doing one of all specialists. Horses, of course, you've got to adapt to your environment. I think, I think sometimes, though, it's, it's a trade-off between the two. So the reason business people ask for effort estimates is because they want to know how long things will take. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they then balance the value, the perceived value, of what they think the value of the, okay. the piece of work is going to be versus how long it's going to take. And, and provided you've got both numbers together, okay. they can then make the decision. I have, no, I have no problem with this whatsoever, yeah. but I ask for them to estimate the value first. Okay. Which is what? Which estimate is what the do. value first. Have you heard of a thing called anchoring? If, you, if, you, if people hear an answer or a number or something from other people and you ask them their opinion, they tend to gravitate towards that. So we could all go and see a film, and half of you may think it's rubbish. The other half of the room thinks it's good, and if one of them speak first, the heart, those who think it's rubbish will start to change your opinion. And it's recently shown with online ratings review, if you go to Amazon, intent on writing a really bad review, and you see that everyone else has put a five-star review, instead of putting a one-star review, you may well put a two-star review or a three-star <coughs> review. You might not go the whole hog to a five-star review, but you will, you, will, you will not be as knocked to low the review as you would. So one reason for not doing um, effort first is, is simply anchoring. You know, it's a, it's a business see that the developers think this will take two weeks, then their value estimate is going to be something similar. Second thing is, most organizations I see aren't as advanced as yours. Most of them create difficulty putting value on something. I think you need to flip the ta tables if only to get the balance right. Um, the, other, the other thing is that we need to close the loop here. In the same way that you can benchmark a team's velocity, you can see what their past performance is, and you can use that as a guide for future work, you should be able to do the same with value. Overwhelmingly, I know you all say you should do it. Very, very few companies actually go back and look. When they delivered a piece of work, did it deliver the expected value? Because if it did deliver the expected value, great. If it didn't, perhaps because you shouldn't have done it in the first place, or perhaps you haven't, you've left money on the table. There's still value to be had there, and there's another piece of work you need to do as well. But until we start benchmarking whether we are delivering value and whether the value we are delivering is in any comp way comparable to the value we expected, we can't benchmark ourselves. This is another reason why I'd like a specialist, an analyst of some sort to be involved, because most developers are often an extra piece of code. Most developers don't have the skills to go and do the analysis to say, the thing we delivered, did it give us value? If you do, great, I, I love you. But there's always more work you should be done, so I want someone on point for doing this, close the loop. Are you actually delivering the value you think you're delivering? You can plan the durations really well, two or four weeks ahead, really certain. I think you can plan the next quarter with some certainty. The next, the two weeks after the next are much more certain than the two weeks at the end. We used to call this a release plan. Now the teams deliver many times during, during an iteration. I don't see much point in that. I think it's more of a, a quarter plan for the next 12 weeks. Outside of that, there's a roadmap. And there's no point in having estimates whatsoever on stuff that may or may not happen in two or three years' time. As stuff moves down from a roadmap, 
into a growth plan, I would expect it to have a value statement on it. As it's in the growth plan, as it moves around to the point where it's going to get done, you may well put some kind of rough estimate on it. As it moves into the iteration, you'll definitely put an estimate on it. You'll definitely break it down. Iterations are primarily for the team, are about tasks. Quarter plans are about stories, and they're about you know, they're for, for your business analysts and people like that. Pair. Out here, roadmap. Who knows? Who knows what could happen? There's a lot you can tell about the future. I know what's happening on December the 25th. I know some people will, will need to get their products in the stores well before that. I also know it's the close of the financial year for some people today. And for some people, it's the end of their tax year in a few days' time. There's some things you can see coming up. And that may be related to things you want to do in your software. But unless you try looking at the future, you, you, you can't know. What's wrong is when you start putting things a year or two years out, and you also start attaching effort levels to them. I want to get you away from focusing on the, the end. Focus on the value. Ask not when will the software, when will the project be done. The right question, what you should be asking is, when will it next deliver value? So think, you've got this team that produces a stream of value, your sausage machine, you're turning the handle, you're putting in storage, you're putting in where? These sausages are dropping out, the sausages are value. A sausage are valuable. Instead of constantly saying, when will you stop making sausages? Why would you stop making sausages? If you're a butcher, and you can buy me, and you can make sausages, and you can sell the sausages, and you can earn more money, why would you stop making sausages? When is the next set of sausages ready? When can I get the next pork sausage? When is the next horse meat sausage coming? Bit of detail, Rex using bogey yellows, unplanned work, green, whatever you like. Visualize it, put it on the board. Boards are lightsabers. Every team needs to make their own board. This board is a real board and probably gives most of you a migraine just looking at it. I could walk you through it, I could explain it. It makes perfect sense if you know this team and you work with this team. Every team has to create a board that is their lightsaber. It models their work, it speaks to the team. Nobody can write a definitive guide. Well, you can write heuristics for boards, but you can't write a guide for how to set up your board. The team have got to create it for themselves. And once you create it, it changes from being a lightsaber to being a voodoo doll. You make this voodoo doll about your process, and then when you want to change your process, you stick pins in a voodoo doll. You can change the board. By changing the board, you can manipulate the process. Start off modeling your process, model it visually, let it work, see what happens, and then when you start to change the board, you'll change the process. I also like to think there's three backlogs. Classic scroll, the product backlog becomes iteration one, iteration two, blah, blah, blah. And the backlog does that, doesn't it? We stuff the backlog full of stuff. I've seen a backlog which measured at 4,000 points, and it was increasing at 7.5% a month. That's like having a mortgage you're underwater with, but you can do it in a point sweep, but still there's stuff for the backlog. I think there's three backlogs. There's all the stuff you might do, the opportunities, things you think might make money, the stuff the CEO's girlfriend thought of in the shower this morning, he's come to you and said, can you put it in the backlog? Of all that stuff, some of it is validating. You, somebody is looking at the backlog and saying, no, Yes, no, yes. And you, val you look at that and you work out which bit is valid, which bit is worthwhile doing, which bit should we be doing. You validate it. And from that, you can make out your sprints. And every time you take a bit of work out here into a new sprint, you pull a bit more over. Every time you schedule a bit more, you've got some more capacity in here. This is limited. You look at your opportunity backlog, you look for the cards, you throw some away, you pick some more out. Your requirements type person is working in that space to get that stuff ready for the next iteration, at which point they pass it over to the team and they pull a bit more from the opportunity backlog, and so it goes. I think three backlogs makes a lot more sense than two to me. Um, you could argue this is a Kanban board. Stuff is just working through the system. One of the problems with boards is where do they start and where do they end? There's always something that happens before the board starts, and there's always something that happens after the board finishes. You could make a board that big! I've seen a board with 25 columns on it. It's kind of self-defeating. The organization was very concerned about the column in the middle, marked development. 
That was outsourced. Those, those, those guys had so much to answer for in the middle. You know, the 12 columns on either side. <laughs> Validated backlog is your quarter plan. It's six iterations out. And as you're doing stuff at this end, as that goes to the sprint, you move it all down, you make the space at the end, you pull it in, you'll be calling these people are working on this stuff, get it ready to go off to the team at that end. Assign the value to them. I'm trying to leave some time for, for questions here, so I'm hoping you've got some questions. The other thing is, in that validate backlog, in that quarterly plan, nothing is certain. We don't deal in certainties in this game. We don't deal in certainties in life. <coughs> What's inflation next month? UK inflation. None of you work for a bank? None of you care? Yeah. What's inflation next year? Whatever it is next month, not times 12, but you know, it, it, the further out you go, the more uncertain it is. That's what we deal with. Work is not certain to be done or uncertain, it's just degrees of probability. We've got to learn to think in grades and probabilities and accept that the world changes in the future. Scaling, very briefly scaling. Who wants to talk about scaling? This is a hot topic, isn't it? Is it safe? Yeah? Who, who, who's looking for some answers to scaling at this conference? Or anyone? I think when people say scaling, when they say how do you scale Zampan or Agile or anything else, Actually, they're not saying how do you scale this, because it's a pretty meaningless word scaling. There's usually three questions they are trying to ask. Do they mean how do you make this work with a large team? How do you make it work with multiple teams? Or how do you govern agile working? If you're going to make it work with a large team, you have to make it work with a small team. You can't make it work with three people, you aren't going to make it work with 30 people. The way you get to work with a large team is to start with something small and grow it. And if you say, well, I haven't got the option, I have to start with a 30 person team because I've got a deadline at the end of the year and no, the, your failure is not an option. If you try and start with a large team, you're probably going to fail anyway. So let, let's, let's push that to one side. How do I manage multiple teams? You can't manage multiple teams unless you've got several teams already, and unless those teams are all performing in their own right. So unless your teams, are, you have teams which perform, there's no point in worrying about how you get the teams to coordinate. And how do you govern agile? Well, this is a more difficult one. How do we govern agile working? Particularly since I've said there's no such thing as a project, and there's no such thing as an end date. Fortunately, we have portfolio management, and we have venture capital. The model for future business development needs to look a lot more like venture capitalists. And they will give you a bit of money, and you will do something. And if it's successful, they'll give you a bit more money. And if it's successful, they'll give you some more money from them and their friends, and you can grow, and they'll give you a bit more. And while you have success, they keep on giving you money. And when you don't have success, we cancel it. Fail fast, fail cheap, salvage from what you've got. So this scaling question, it's three different, at least, three different questions. When we say scaling, we hide a whole bunch of detail under there. Oh. And I promised early on to talk about Goodhart's law. Charles Goodhart, he's retired now, he was a professor at the London School of Economics. He was one of the men who set the interest rates in this country. He was a uh, treasury economist for a long time. And back in the 1980s, he stated, and he observed statistical regularity will tend to collapse once pressure is put upon it for control purposes. The most obvious example we have in the agile world is story points. The moment you start saying to your team, well then team, it was good, you did 20 points last iteration, let's see if we can do 25 points this iteration. Or, we're going to put a bonus on the line here, if we can get 25 points in the next month, we're going to give you a thousand pound each. Once you start signing business contracts and points, so I, I know a company that tried to buy a points-based contract, and I know a company that tried to sell a points-based contract. <laughs> Luckily, we're in different domains, but yeah, utter disaster. If you start using story points to manage your work, to tie up your financial incentives, you destroy them completely. 
because you're using them for control purposes. And you see this again and again and again in other contexts. Uh, we can get an awful lot of measurements out of our champions. I think it's down to like more we get our traditional teams. If only because when you start thinking about the Kanban board and all those columns, you can start to measure things. How long does it take progress between points? How long does it spend waiting? You can, they are rich in metrics, simple systems of rich in metrics. If, however, you start trying to control those metrics, you will destroy them. Do you remember a few years ago when all the newspapers had the stories about the hospitals in England who were discharging patient, patients just as they reached 48 hours? Because they had a target that all patients would be discharged within 48 hours. And so once you got to 47 hours, 55 minutes, they'd be discharged into the car park and we admitted they had a target to meet and it corrupted the way they did their statistics. Agile systems and Kanban systems give you lots of rich metrics to understand your systems. Lots of, mix, met, lots, lots of metrics to think about how you can improve your working. However, if you try and improve the metrics rather than the underlying thing, you will destroy the information the metric is giving you. I'm very sorry if you work in a Six Sigma organization, because you are. Anyone ever worked in a Six Sigma organization? Yeah. I, I worked in a Six Sigma organization. They reduced all change to a project. Before you could change anything, you had to have a project to change. And a project had to be signed off by all the senior managers, and getting time with the senior managers was jolly difficult. So as a result, they stopped all change. If you remember nothing else, remember the good parts of the world. And don't use the loss hidden point as a control mechanism. Ultimately, going back to where I started and, and Zampan, it's, it's a roll your own mechanism. We've got, we've got any roll your own smokers in the room? Yeah. You make your own method. You look at the tools that are out there. You look at the case studies. You talk to your friends. You look at the environment you are in. And you decide what you can do now. And you do some of it, and you get better. And you repeat the exercise. What can we improve? You need to work out your own way of working. I encourage you to sit down with the other people in your teams and talk about how you're working. What are the principles you adhere to? People like to say agile is principle-based and value-based and all that. You can't make somebody else adopt your principles and values. You can say agile is principle, value-based as much as you like, but you can't force them on anybody. It's like trying to forcibly change somebody's voting habits. You can encourage people to change. You can encourage them to see a different value, different principle. But you can't force it on them. Sit down with your teams. What are the things your teams regard as important as principles? What are the practices? What are the things you actually do? What? What would you suggest to other teams? If your team was going to do this presentation, what would the presentation look like? What would you suggest people do? And perhaps what would you suggest they don't do? And when you work that out, if you work in a large organization, do a presentation to your other teams. In presenting Zanban, you can take it as a method and it might be useful to you. I'm happy for you to do that. What I'd really like you to do is use it as inspiration to create your own method. Is Zanban anything new? Well, more well, six years ago, I asked this question on the Kanban dad mailing list. What is the defining characteristic of a Kanban, of Kanban that make a Kanban and not something else? And David Anderson said, are you limiting work in progress? Are you signaling to pull work from an upstream process? If it is a whip limited system, then it is Kanban. I haven't specifically talked about whip limitation, I've hinted at a few times, in which case Zampan might be Kanban. The other interesting thing is, David's kind of moved away from this definition. If you look at the blog entries he has added this year, he, he, he's moved, he, his thinking on Kanban, and obviously it's not just David's community now, his thinking has moved away from this. What I see happening with Kanban is the same as happening with Scrum. These guys have come up with a great idea and a great brand name. And start off when they talk about software development, but you know, people think, does it work somewhere else? Does it work somewhere else? And gradually, they relax it a bit and expand it a bit. And so Scrum can be applied to all sorts of things now. And Kanban is not a software development approach anymore. Kanban's a change mechanism. 
and it's universally applicable in all of it. <coughs> they kind of lose the specificness of it being a software method. And when it becomes less specific, when it becomes more general, it also makes it more difficult to explain to us, the people on the ground, what does it actually do? Now, how do you actually do Scrum? As Sandra said, it's one of the Scrum guide these days is pretty devoid of most specifics. If you go back a few years, I had more specifics. The, the Scrum guide seems to change every time I look at it. It just seems to mutate into something else. I'm sure a few years ago, it really didn't like project managers. And it did talk about user stories and things. Maybe it did, maybe I imagine it. But it changes over time. They are changing it. You need to think about your teams. Kanban and Scrum, they change over time. You can't be doing Scrum because it's a moving target. And you become less specific, less, less, less prescriptive. So think about it for yourself. This is just, you know, as I said earlier on, Zampan is the way I describe Agile. It's probably nothing more than that. Hopefully you've, you've picked up some ideas for what you could do. Um, I, I ended up writing down all my thoughts into this. This has now become Zampan the book. Um, I still don't think it's finished. I mean, lean book books are probably never finished, but if you like, that's, that's the first formal release. That's version 1.0 beat the test or something. Um, I started to mess around with a second volume called Management Heuristics. Let me know what you think. I'd, lo I'd love to have some feedback. Um, and uh, just tell me what brand of cola you're drinking. Oh, was, yeah, I know why that slide like that. that. There's a discount. If you, if you go to that website and stick in that discount code, you'll get money off, but um, hmm. a few minutes ago I thought I had too much time for questions, now I think I'm not going to time for questions. Got questions, comments, observations? That was rubbish. Encore? Yeah. Um, I'm going around over the lunch just without being asked me. Thank you very much. CEO's girlfriend has the idea in the shower. <laughs> does it end when you deploy the software? Does it end when you've evaluated the software? You can measure lead time, but you have to decide from where to where. Yeah. So it's probably several lead times. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Very good. My pleasure. So, so I think what you described, what do you think we're doing in marketing? We, just, we didn't have a name for it, but it's hand up there. Yeah. Well, and, and that's ultimately I come sort of only from reading about yes. manufacturing Kanban. So, so I, I thought yes, and, and it was the, the idea of the flow was the thing that I thought sort of suited the way yes. the yeah. way that we develop software. Is what you're trying to do is get that continuous flow of work through yes. what you describe as yeah. a sausage machine. But it's actually all about continuing, if you like, the, the kind of DevOps move now. It's continuous delivery. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I. Um, yeah. And I think that's the so that name that you put on it. I've come across several teams 
that do similar things in some way merge through on Canva knowingly or more often, as you say, they just interpret it differently. And part, part of these, so something I, I, don't, I don't think this is, is something original. Right? I mean, I think it's something. It is something which you say it's inside of the Certainly it's something. Because Edward's warm, I want to ask. going to say this. You don't think that. You must know completely in the spring or something else. And it, no, this can work. I, I, from what you said, it sounded like just literally just how it's quite an advanced. Actually, you're, you've met people you've checked before. You're quite advanced in what you're doing. And for some scummers at the moment, so I say, but you should be complete at the end of the sprint, or you should, or you shouldn't be doing this. I think it's wrong. So, so the particular team I work is is different to other people within a user yeah. journey organisation. We have a, a team that support the, the website. We are doing Scrum. Yeah, we're definitely doing Scrum. Yeah. We're yeah. supporting one of the internal mm -hmm. teams uh, uh, doing revenue management. Yeah, well, yeah, just, yeah. just slightly different things. Mm -hmm. We're doing stuff this is doing. Guy. And from from our position where we can look to kind of just churn and work through every couple of weeks, but we're not reached around the time scale, so we have to reverse it. Roughly two to three weeks in our plan. Just cadence, I think, we have to work. So we're looking to be delivery teams when they're five weeks, six weeks cycles, six weeks, I think it is now. It's a very rigid yeah. six weeks cycle, they have very strict definitions of done, they can do things in a very strict way. So okay. automatically, I'm, I'm I think it's all off. We, we, we kind of look at those, we think they've kind of lost sight of what it is. But I think Sandra was talking about this morning with yeah. the concept of agile, meaning flexible, yes. moving with the, the yes. needs of the business. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, which is what we try to do. So yeah. we very much, if no. the business guys come along and say, look, can you just stop doing yeah. that right yeah. now? Because I'm this thing is not working with me. Just keep it steady. So we say, okay, yeah. We've only lost the weeks of the work, we'll shelf it. Yeah, the way you come back to it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you start again. Yeah, yeah. It's part of a protective. Well, I'd love to have your your your, um, your comments on, on what I've written. Right. And where you your uh, variations or support for it. Yeah. Um, if, if, I sent that coupon, right. but I think it's like $20. Oh, well, I'll, 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 yeah, I'll look at that. Yeah. And so if you read it just the money mail, I mean, I might give you a complete freebie. <laughs> I will do. Probably right. <laughs> Free fees, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly. Oh, I sent that coupon up yesterday. I was amazed. I've got a few. I've got another hundred dollars due for lean book. It's amazing. Try it. I haven't come across it before. Yeah, lean book. Your book's on lean book, isn't it? This is yeah. Lean book's awesome. <laughs> yeah. There's all sorts. So, so it's over three thousand copies. My book. Wow. Four, so five, is it essentially? Dollars. So so have you done, presumably? Traditional publishing as well, so yeah. through Wiley or an A press, yeah, Robert's, the Robert's, Robert's, yeah. Press, yeah. Right. So is it just you write the oh, same yeah, stuff, but you're publishing it yourself, yeah. and they just give you the tools yeah. to do it? This, yeah. this is of course you app. you lose all the editing like like steps. And yeah. Okay. They so said there's an app. You could go and hire editors and marketing. Just yeah. that I don't know what. You still get so copy. technical reviews. I guess what you have to peer review. No, I, the, the the pack, know, so. He did yeah. say when he came around before. Oh, you just the details. You just put it up and wait for people to comment back. How can I get me? People leaving really poor reviews. Maybe you need to fix it. I think you're saying that. I missed all the pre-stuff. Just walked in. Just as you. I think you're about two minutes in. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Yeah. Didn't get through that. So what are the publishers doing about it? So that you live in the area. Good question. I don't know. I used to put my kid at school and went down to the train. So, uh, so the likes of you know, the rocks is in this world. And so you be here so I will be you know, like here for the rest of the day. Whether I come tomorrow or Thursday is the fluid the brand situation. If you're yeah. writing for a particular company, oh, they have to be. So, so I mean, I've you, you had another session. Publishing two. companies approach me to so one to my mind, yeah. kind of license my book. Oh, right, yeah. okay. And they're like, we, we'll give you a dollar a copy or something. From a different session. So we we can sell the book. So do they presumably they just take commission? No. So whatever. Yeah, well, so, so well, Leap Park has, has a full They seem to pay for some people. Yeah, they're taking their cut. Leap Park, yeah, yes, but the Leap Park cuts. I've had a month later, I've got the note saying, um, you, you need Whereas to invoice. Whereas the traditional publishers can't okay. compete. Oh, because they've got this whole body of staff. Invoice from God. Sales to distribution. So I don't know, it's really weird. I don't particularly understand. And also, in the speaker's room before, some people were saying they they weren't getting paid. Check that out. Yeah. Right. So we know what's happening. Thank they you. Weren't they, were so they, they weren't. They weren't. They had been paid sometimes in the past, but not this time. Although they've been paid for their pre-conference, but they weren't being paid for their That's main conference. Right. Yeah. You get paid for a pre-conference. Right? Hmm. That's quite normal. Yeah. yeah. You normally get paid for a pre-conference. Not, not for doing talks at the conference. Yeah. Well, I said last year was the only time I ever paid me for speaking at the conference. Debris. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
Peter, but well, I've had it before. Tech, for instance, Microsoft Tech I paid. Yeah. I paid five hundred. A lot of Well, now with the NSA, I've got it all booked anyway. Mm -hmm. But that's usually the, the the conference that are organised by a large vendor, yes. such as Oracle, Microsoft. Yeah. They usually pay you for. Is it a dollars. community conference, or is it a vendor, or right. a particularly a particular community has a commercial interest, like DSGM guys, for instance? Yeah. It's usually conferences like these don't pay you; they just pay for your travel. Yeah. 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 And I've had occasions where they pay for the hotel, mm -hmm. but not for your trip, but they pay you for your talk. Hmm. So it's like the U conference in Munich; they pay like. I think it's 200 euros for a talk, and they pay for your hotel. For your they, don't, they don't pay for your. Right. I, I would rather talk. they do that, and I tried to persuade the the conference committee for Agile on the Beach this year to just pay everybody a flat fee and say sort out your own arrangements, because the, some people last year booked their train tickets well in advance and had really cheap train tickets, and other people left their tickets at the last minute and so their expenses were like that. I said, can we just pay everyone a flat fee? And you could then for travel. Yeah, but just pay them, pay them a fee to travel. And if, yeah, if they save some money by by coming on a, a, a funny train, then you know they, they pocket the difference. Right. If they leave till the last minute and they spend more on the train than they need to, then they pay the difference. That's exactly why I quote flat fees for doing train courses. Yes. Like I've sort of walked through all the yes. variability of the price of Yeah, yeah. I, I got my problem. I can go business class or sit in the back. Yeah. If, if people come to me direct, I, I will do that. I know Kevin and John and some others do that. But when it's used when it's a third party, a skilled matter of someone, yeah. Yeah, they used to do it, but I don't know how they manage their fees. But Kevin and I don't know. Kevin charges flat fees as well. But I, what percentage of Kevin's is direct and what percentage is through brokers? Make flat fee for travelling or for, for, for the whole game? For the whole thing? Yeah. Including the talk? Yeah. yeah. It would be great to get paid for the talk. Private, private stuff, in companies. Yeah, private yeah, training courses. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, I, I also arrange flat fees for that. Yeah. The whole, con the whole conference industry is... And, and well, what also happens, by the way, is that the, the companies themselves arrange for the traveling. That, to me, that's much easier, because I don't have to do all the arrangements. Yes. I'd rather that not happen, because then I get into discussions yeah. with them, like, if I get the train somewhere in the UK, I'll normally pay for me to go first class because if you decide to train in advance, it's not that much more expensive. Yeah, but it avoids the whole conversation. Oh, you should be going standard class. Well, first class is temporary.